All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 8, Growing Pains, The New Republic, 1790 to 1820. This is going to be Section 1, Competing Visions, Federalists and Democratic Republicans. So where we last left off was with the ratification of the Constitution. Recall that the first national government of the United States was the Articles of Confederation. Uh, however, the Articles proved really to be too weak to solve the nation's problems, particularly the financial problem, uh, outstanding war debt. But there was a lot of other problems as well. And so that led to the Constitutional Convention where the nation's leaders met in Philadelphia uh, and over the course of a year more or less created a new governing document. And that of course was what we call the Constitution. And after that was ratified, meaning that it was put into effect, you then had the election of the very first president of the United States, who of course is George Washington and Washington's administration. But those who favored the Constitution, who had said vote yes on the Constitution, were the Federalists, right? So the Federalists were the ones who advocated to vote yes on the new Constitution. Uh, and they, of course, won that debate. In, you know, in general, generally speaking, Federalists are those who want a stronger national government. Typically, that means uh, put the power in fewer hands so that you get things done more efficiently. So stronger national government. And it was the Federalists, those who created the Constitution, that were more or less elected into power. So you had the first president, like we said, who was unanimously elected. That was George Washington. He was a Federalist, right? So he belonged to essentially what was originally just a group of people who favored sort of similar ideas, but it more or less transforms into what we might call the first political party, right? So Federalists, we might call this the first political party in the United States, although it didn't necessarily originate that way. Uh, when Washington was elected to be the first president of the United States, he assigned his presidential cabinet. Those are those members who are sort of like his inner circle, uh, he, who he refers to on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was named as Secretary of Treasury. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was the Secretary of State, and Henry Knox was appointed Secretary of War. So these people made up Washington's cabinet, and Washington chose these individuals. Hamilton and Jefferson were different ideologically, but were seen as being the best person for the job. And so this set a precedent of not over the president choosing their own cabinet members, but you know being expected to choose whoever is most suited for the job rather than who you like the most, for example. Uh, and the first Congress. So of course, Congress refers to the House of Representatives, which was created by the constitutional uh, by the Constitution. Uh, with the Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise uh, and the Senate. And so when it comes to the House and the Senate, they're responsible for passing laws. And in this first election, we're talking mostly about Federalists. So these are individuals who want to strengthen the national government. And they do that two ways or with two laws we'll, we'll talk about here. The Judiciary, uh, Judiciary Act created... The Supreme Court. Recall that one of the problems under the Articles government was that you had no overarching legal system. So each state had their own laws and their own judges, but when two states got into a legal dispute, there was nothing really to solve that. The Constitution solved that problem. So the Judiciary Act creates the Supreme Court or the you know what we call the third branch of the government. The Tariff Act was used to, so a tariff, if you're not familiar, a tariff is a tax on imports. So any goods that were imported to the United States, the United States taxed them. And the purpose was to raise money 
to pay off debt, right? To pay off debt. One of the big problems in this post-American Revolution period was that the United States owed a lot of money. The states owed a lot of money. They owed a lot of money to soldiers who had fought in the war. So by taxing imports, this was a good way of raising money. And of course, this would be something that the Federalists would, uh, would support. Now, the economy was the most dire problem, right? So the economy was probably the most dire situation that was going on uh, right after the Constitution was created. In fact, it was a big reason as to why the Articles government was gotten rid of. And so it's going to be up to Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of Treasury, in order to solve this economic problem. However, before we get to that, uh, we talked also about the Anti-Federalists. Recall the Anti-Federalists were the ones who said, vote no on the Constitution. They believed that uh, the Constitution was too much power in too few hands, but many of them came around and said, look, we will vote yes on the new Constitution if you include a Bill of Rights. And so one of the things that the first Congress did, even though they're controlled by the Federalists, was to pass the Bill of Rights, which created 10 amendments or additions slash changes to the Constitution, uh, and you can uh, look more in the text for specifically what those amendments are. But it's interesting to note that the Bill of Rights was not actually part of the original Constitution. It was a promise the Federalists made to the Anti-Federalists in exchange for their voting yes and ratifying the Constitution. So you have that. And of course, the Bill of Rights is uh, you know a list of rights in which the government cannot encroach upon. So these are protections against the government. If you look at the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, for example, it says, um, Congress shall pass no law that restricts freedom of speech, freedom of press, et cetera, et cetera. So this is protection against the government. So let's get to uh, Hamilton's economic program. So this is Alexander Hamilton that you see right here. And of course, now it's his job to really solve the nation's economic problems. Probably the biggest issue was debt and the fact that the United States had owed a lot of money from the war, so we might call this war debt. And Hamilton creates three different reports, the report on public credit, the report on the National Bank, and lastly, the report on manufacturers. And all of these reports essentially outline what the problem is, but also propose a particular solution. So. Report on public credit. So in the eyes of Alexander, Andrew, Alexander Hamilton, one of the biggest problems with owing this huge, enormous debt was the way that creditors would view the United States. Creditors are somebody who loans out money. So Hamilton is concerned about the people that the United States owes money to. Creditors could be foreign, could be domestic. And the problem for Alexander Hamilton is that you know, if the United States does not pay its debt, if it borrows money and fails to pay it back, it's really going to lose in some ways kind of like the respect of the world. We might call this, uh, you know, legitimacy. You know, the United States is a brand new nation and it's very important for it to signal to the rest of the world that it's a legitimate government and that it's going to pay back its money. And so Hamilton said, do justice to the creditors, right? Do justice to the creditors. Well, this becomes a problem uh, for some, I should say, because when you look at both sides of the equation, you have the creditors, people who loaned out money who are expecting it back, and then you have the debtors, right? And those are people who actually owe the money. Uh, Hamilton is favoring this side here, and of course he's going to get opposition from those who actually owe debt and, and other people as well. Um, another way that Hamilton seeks to try and solve the economic problem is to issue bonds. Bonds are kind of like, um, you know, a bond is sort of like, a, like an IOU, right? Uh, it's supposed to gain value over time, and so the idea is that you can buy a bond and we'll just say, you know, this is a $10 bond and bonds come in different years. So for example, you might have a 10 year $10 bond. And the idea is that you as an American citizen, you could buy this from the government. So you send them your money, the government gets 10 bucks, right? And of course, this is very instrumental in uh, solving this war debt problem. 
However, this bond increases its value over time. So for example, over the course of 10 years, the United States essentially says that we're gonna you know, owe you 15 bucks in the future. So as a citizen, you can think of bonds as like investing in your country, right? Investing in your country. And this is a way of solving some of the economic problems. But this sparked off a huge debate about the nation's finances. And I wanna get back to this point here about creditors versus debtors. Because what had happened during the course of the articles period and, and eventually into the constitutional period and afterwards was that a lot of speculators had bought up revolutionary debt. So speculators are people who buy debt and you know speculate, which means kind of to like guess that it will increase in value. So if you're an American Revolutionary War veteran, right, you have this certificate, this IOU, and this is your Revolutionary War salary. And let's say you were supposed to be paid $100, but it's been three years, and you don't think that you're gonna be paid that $100 at any time soon. And so a speculator comes across and says, you know what, I'll give you $30 for that, right? I'll give you $30 for that IOU. Listen, you don't have to wait around for this money, you can just take the cash now. And a lot of Revolutionary War veterans and a lot of debtors had sold that to the speculators. So Hamilton, by saying that he's gonna you know, pay off these debts, a lot of the money is actually gonna to go to the speculator class. And that sparks off more controversy that Hamilton's not really working in the interests of the American people, but rather kind of like American businesses, American investments. You also have the problem of state debts, right? Some states owe more money than others. For states with large debts, it's a good idea to pay off the debt or at least pay it off as a nation. What Hamilton wants to do is to combine state debts right into one giant national debt and then you get some opposition about it you also have a disagreement over the nation's capital in terms of you know should it be located in new york which is the major financial center for the united states or in the south right or in the south and so what all this leads to eventually are some compromises so here's what happens in regards to hamilton's plan the state debts are combined Right, so there is the creation of not just individual state debts, but a national debt. Uh, what Hamilton's opponents get is a capital located in the South. And so where the first Congress met was actually New York. Washington was inaugurated in New York, but that was too close to financial interests, right? You had Wall Street and you had the government too close to one another. And so people who opposed Hamilton, like Thomas, and Thomas Jefferson said, Let's move the nation's capital out of the banking center of, of the US uh, so it won't be so responsive to the interests of bankers and instead be more responsive to the interests of people. And so you had the creation of Washington, D.C., which is where the nation's capital would be located away from banking and investor um, interests in New York City. So that's what happened in regards to debts, right? A national debt was created, they were combined, and a new nation's capital was, uh, was created. Secondly, Hamilton's report on the National Bank. A national bank is what we might also call a central bank. Uh, England had already had this, the Bank of England. And really that's what Hamilton wanted to do. Creating a national bank would solve a few problems. First of all, it would discipline state banks, right? So it would create a uniform currency. Uh, at this time, states were free to print whatever type of money that they wanted to, and they really could print as much money as they wanted to. And so by creating a national bank, you could control the state banks. You can create a more uh, central kind of uh, uh, economic system there, create uniform currency, and make sure that inflation wasn't getting too out of control. Uh, the national bank could also loan out money. This could be in the form of investments in the nation. Right, so if American merchants needed to borrow money, the central bank or the national bank could do that. It could also store money. Uh, this was particularly in the case from selling land. So if the US sells land, they can store that money, but also could have private investors. And the idea by having private investors was that 
you know, there would be people who were invested in the well-being of the nation. And so this, in general, this national bank was just a way to kind of uh, better control the nation's economy, right? Uh, and in fact, it did get created, right? So the first national bank was created. Now, of course, this creates somewhat of a um, controversy with, uh, with those who oppose it, Jefferson and Madison in particular. The last report, so uh, we have the paying off of the debts, we have the uh, creation of the National Bank, the very last thing, the report on manufacturers. This was the ability of the United States to produce, to really cut off ties with the colonial economy. We might call this economic independence. Remember, the United States economy was heavily reliant upon England, you know, especially under those mercantilist laws and the Navigation Acts. Uh, it was time now that the revolution had been successful and the Constitution now has or, or gives greater power to the government to actually, uh, you know, put forward some of these policies. It was time for the United States to become more economically independent. That meant raising money via taxation, right? Raise money via taxation, specifically on whiskey. Whiskey. It means not just creating tariffs. Again, recall what a tariff is. We'll go up here. Tariff, 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 right? A tariff is a tax on an import. And here we can see that the Tariff Act was used to raise money to pay the debt. But tariffs also do another thing, and that is to protect domestic business. So if we scroll down here, protective tariffs means to protect American business, right? Protect American business. If you have a commodity, an American-made commodity and a foreign-made co commodity, if you tax the foreign good, more people are going to buy domestic, more people will buy American, and that's better for the American economy. It raises money, but it also helps out American businesses. Subsidies uh, is kind of like, you know, a, sub a subsidy or subsidizing American businesses more or less means to provide very cheap loans, you know, before market price. So this was also designed to protect American businesses or invest in them. And of course, when it comes to taxation uh, in particular, uh, you did see those taxes passed. Now, a lot of this created, a lot of this economic activity, and for the most part, we should mention this, and I'll go ahead and put this in a different color, that Hamilton got pretty much all of his economic plan, and it was successful in saving the nation's economy, right? So the creation of a national bank, the paying off of debts or the combining of debts, the creation of a national bank, the creation of new taxes, it proved to be successful in causing the uh, economy to recover. So we generally consider Hamilton's economic plan to be very successful. But it also sparked off debate, and this was primarily those who were opposed to the Federalists, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, who said, look, all, all of these economic measures might be good for the economy, but are they legal? Is it constitutional? Right? And both Madison and Jefferson uh, believed that these policies were an overreach of power. That the Constitution gave no right to Hamilton to create a national bank, for example, and, and therefore he shouldn't be allowed to do that. Uh, they believe that these were too much in what we might call the um, uh, the elite interests, right? That Hamilton, with all of his protective tariffs, favored businesses over the actual workers, that by paying back the debts, you really were favoring the creditors and the banks at the expense of, you know, the veterans and the farmers and everything else like that. And so uh, Madison and Jefferson said, no, we shouldn't be working in the interests of the elite, of the business, of the bankers. Instead, we should be, you know, working more in the interests of the yeoman farmer. And this idea of 
the yeoman farmer is very closely tied to Thomas Jefferson and his views about the nation. Essentially, a yeoman farmer is an independent farmer, right? Independent farmer, you know, and, and that's the way that Thomas Jefferson envisions this democratic republic surviving, that the nation can only survive or democracy can only survive if it's a nation of independent farmers. You know, there's a lot of stress on a uh, sort of virtue that goes along with working with things like soil. And that's really what uh, Jefferson and Madison want to do. Uh, they criticized Hamilton and the Federalists for transforming the Republic into a monarchy. Uh, recall the, the Federalists want a stronger national government. The Democratic Republicans, which is essentially the organization that Madison and Jefferson create. We might call this the second political party, right? The second political party. So if you were somebody who believed that the Federalists were overreaching their, uh, you know, uh, were overreaching with their power, if you believe that the Federalists were trying to transform the United States more into England like a monarchy, you would find yourself in this camp. And you had newspapers that were really dedicated to sort of hashing out the differences between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. And these two first uh, organizations, uh, organization might be kind of a, a little bit misleading term because some of these weren't really all that organized, but you had the, the Democratic Republicans on the one hand and you had the Federalists on the other. Democratic Republicans had support from artisans. These are people who make things, let's say make stuff with their hands, right? So whereas the investors and the bankers really favored the Federalists, uh, you know, sort of the citizens, the, the people who made things with their hands, the farmers, they tended to favor more the Democratic Republicans. The Federalists favored stronger national government. Democratic Republicans feared a stronger national government. They thought it would become too tyrannical. So we see this debate about the Constitution continuing to play out even in the post-Constitution uh, period, right? Where can you find that balance between tyranny, too much power, and anarchy, not enough power? Uh, it was also in this post-constitutional period that citizenship was defined, and this is kind of an important point here, because the Constitution was written in a very vague manner, and it was created as a structure for which government should operate, but it wasn't very particular with the specifics. So, for example, in terms of, you know, who's a citizen and who's not a citizen, well, you know, the Constitution begins with the three, three words, we the people. And so it really isn't particular about who the people are. Uh, there are only two other groups mentioned in the Constitution. Indians are one, who were considered to be separate sovereign entities, and quote unquote other persons, which was essentially the word for slaves. So in terms of who the people are, that would take a legislative measure, right? So the 1790 Naturalization Act more or less outlined that citizens would only be considered if they were free white persons, essentially creating a white republic. And this term free white persons is going to describe for the most part who citizenship is open to and who it excludes. And for a very long time, it's gonna exclude anybody besides free white persons. When it came to voting, Again, every citizen uh, had the right, or every citizen could potentially vote depending on state laws. For the most part, it required the ownership of property. So we're not talking about a very democratic process. Uh, in every single state, it was required that you, you either owned property or paid some sort of taxes. There were very few exceptions to that rule. In every single state, it required that men, they had to be a man in order to vote, with one exception, and that was New Jersey. So for a very short period, we'll say from you know the 1780s to 1807, women were able to vote in New Jersey. That was changed in 1807, but for the most part, pay property, uh, only men can vote, and you have to be a free white person.